Welcome to South Point Church Online. We want to say hi to our Southern Maryland community. We also want to welcome those watching in different parts of the country and maybe even around the world. My name is Matt. I'm part of the team here at South Point. And on behalf of our amazing volunteers and staff, we want to say thanks for joining us today. Hey, last week we kicked off a series about faith and fear. And then the question mark means what are those words even mean. You see, right now in this season, we're hearing more about faith and fear than ever before. You can't go onto Facebook without seeing a meme about it. You can't go onto Instagram without seeing an inspirational quote. And you definitely can't go onto YouTube or Vimeo without seeing a video. But in this unprecedented season, where there is nothing normal in our life, it becomes even more important that you, that me, that we navigate these two words, faith and fear, in a way Way that is wise, in a way that is healthy, in a way that is truthful. And so last week we admitted a hard truth together, and I'm going to put it up on the screen for us, and it's this, that when we overswing to an extreme, we end up out of tune with reality. Listen, I don't like this truth, but the reality is, is that when I like an idea or I support something, I naturally overswing to an extreme. It's something that we all do. But when we swing to an extreme, we often go out of touch with reality. And as we walk through how to avoid unhealthy extremes, especially when it comes to faith and fear, we ran into this truth that we discovered last week. And it's this, faith is relational, not circumstantial. You see, faith has nothing to do with the what around us. Faith has to do with the who we put our trust in. Now, if you happen to miss last week, that's okay. You can go on to our YouTube channel and catch up. And I really want to encourage you that you would kind of like our Facebook page, uh, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe on YouTube as we're putting out a lot of content, and that way you won't miss any of it. Hey, this week, I want to start off and kick us off with a crazy truth that you probably already know. And the reason I want to kick off this Sunday with the crazy truth that you probably already know is because all of us might be asking the question, why does faith even matter? And that is a fair and good question. But here's the crazy truth about this word, faith, that we've been talking about. And I'm going to put it up on the screen for us. And it's this right here. Faith is a daily practice that everyone, listen, everyone, regardless of your religious belief, listen, faith is something that every human being on the planet earth practices regardless of your religious faith or background. It doesn't matter whether you're an atheist or agnostic, whether you've never been to church, gone to church, or have a different kind of religious background. Every single person daily practices faith. And you might be going, Matt, are you sure about that? Let me give you an example. Um, maybe you just want to click uh, eat out in um, kind of in the text there. But how many of us have eaten out during this pandemic? You're eating out in faith that one, that they were clean, that they don't have COVID-19, that they used good food. You believe that they were practicing good health things and you ate that food. How many of us have walked into a room, hit a light switch, but didn't wait, but just kept on walking? Because we believe that as soon as we hit the switch, the light would come on. That's why you're partway into the room if the light bulb is burned out. I mean, how many of us have flown on a plane? Did you see that pilot? Pilot get in? Did you see him inspect the plane to make sure it's safe? No, you took it by faith. How many of us have us have cooked or drank with tap water? We take by faith that it's good for us and it's clean. How many of us have sent a text just expecting it to get to where it's supposed to go? Listen, every day, all of us practice faith regardless of our religious beliefs. Faith is something that everyone practices. And here's what I discovered, and it's a truth that you already know. Humanity doesn't have a problem with faith itself. Humanity has a problem with faith when it comes to two things, putting our faith in the wrong thing, and we'll get that later in the series. And the other one is an unhealthy extreme of faith. And today I want to look at an unhealthy extreme of faith when it comes to following Jesus. And I'm going to put up on the screen and it falls into two kind of extremes. And here's the first one. I call it trust fund faith. And, and what I mean by trust fund faith is goes something like this, is that, listen, you and I are meant to be children of God. God wants to adopt us back into the family, right, as sons and daughters. And that invitation is for everyone, right? And so people go, listen, 
I'm meant to be a child of God. And so God wants to bless me. And so God wants me to have a car. He wants me to have a job. He wants me to find him or her that's right. He wants me to be blessed. He wants me to get the best parking spot, get those season tickets, right? Like trust fund faith is where we go. Listen, it's all about God's blessings now. I'm a child of God and I'm gonna be blessed. And so God is gonna take care of me. And, and, and that is kind of the trust fund faith. Now, I wanna say something a little bit harsh and, and I don't mean it to be personal, but there's a reason why churches that believe this are full. That's why people will support churches and give money to this. It's because if we're really honest, God becomes an excuse for us to be selfish and greedy. And that's not what Jesus came to do. Jesus taught his followers that they were to serve and to sacrifice, to daily take up their cross and follow him. Now there's another extreme of faith and it's called the earn it faith. And you've probably met followers of Jesus like this. They don't smile. They don't have fun. They're really grumpy. And they're like, we'll never get it on this side, but I'm going to hold on for all my blessings. And they're just kind of miserable and they're not happy. And the reality is, is, is that they're probably as equally selfless as the trust fund faith, because the reason they're grumpy or sad or suffering, and they're probably not even really suffering when compared to what true suffering is, is that they want the blessings that come later, which is all about God's blessings later. And if we're truthful about both of these extremes, trust fund faith or earn it faith, is it's really all about the blessings we get. And here's the amazing thing. I don't think that Jesus wants us to fall into either one of these extremes. Matter of fact, Jesus tells us a couple of things. Matter of fact, we're going to take a look at the words of Jesus himself. We're going to put one of them up on the screen and it says this, the time is now, he said, the kingdom of God has has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now listen, if you're here watching today and maybe you either grew up in church or maybe you heard about church, maybe that word repent kind of like just makes you go, ah. but don't worry. Repent just simply means to change direction. But did you get what Jesus said? The time is what? Just maybe if you want to type in in the chat, the time is is now. You see, Jesus teaches that the kingdom is come, the kingdom is now, that God up there, heaven, can come in and live on the inside of us and get the hell out of us, and that as his followers, we can bring the kingdom of God wherever we go. Jesus came to bring life and life to the full. It's something that we can experience in the now. But what I love about Jesus is that he was a truth teller. Matter of fact, that's not the only statement Jesus made. Matter of fact, Jesus also made made this statement. In this world, you will have, now what's that word? Maybe you want to type it in the chat. In this world, you will have, what's the word? Trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. The followers of Jesus experienced trouble and persecution. Jesus experienced persecution and trouble. Listen, just because we love God and follow Jesus, none of us gets a pass. And you see that thing about the extremes? Each of them had a portion of the truth, but they didn't have the whole of truth. And you see in this where the kingdom is now and will have trouble leads you and I to a truth this morning that Jesus teaches us. And I'm going to put it up and I'm going to say it kind of this way. Faith in Jesus. Now I want to stop here because listen, I want to say something. Faith in Jesus is not a political statement. Faith in Jesus is not a religious statement. It's not faith in a pastor. It's not faith in an organization. It's faith in a person named Jesus who conquered hell and death, whose tomb is empty, who was risen from the grave. Listen, I'm not talking about organized religion or political system. I'm talking about faith in Jesus is a secure inheritance. It is something we get later. And we know it's secure because the tomb is empty. Listen, for three, listen, for three and a half centuries, the church was persecuted. Before there was a Bible, followers of Jesus persevered through some of the worst persecution in history, not because of ideas or saying, but because Jesus conquered hell and death and the tomb was empty. We know our security is, our inheritance is secure because of the empty tomb. But it's a secure inheritance with a deposit now. And here's what I kind of mean is, uh, I've mentioned this before. Um, this month, my wife and I celebrated 26 years of marriage. Now, when we got engaged, I gave my wife like a deposit that 
on kind of my statement, will you marry me? I commit to being married to you. I gave her an engagement ring that was kind of a sign of the promise that someday we'd stand together in front of family and friends and God and say yes to each other forever. And so God gives us a deposit now. And that is the gift of his presence that comes and lives in our heart. It's called the Holy Spirit. Now we're gonna talk about both of those things a little bit later in the series, but faith in Jesus is a secure inheritance with a deposit and now, and here's why this is so important. When you and I get onto an unhealthy extremes of faith, where we have trust fund faith, or we have wait for it faith, it leads to this problem that I bet all of us have seen and all of us may have experienced either on social media or in person with other people. And we're gonna put it up on the screen. Misunderstanding faith can cause dysfunctional behavior. When we believe God is all about blessing us, then we live a selfish and greedy life. When we believe we don't get anything now and it's all for later, then we have no joy. We, we, we don't believe that God is good. Misunderstanding faith can cause dysfunctional behavior and damage God's reputation. Listen, I want to say something. Maybe you grew up in a church where it was a trust fund faith. You get it all now. You're a child of God. You get to be blessed. You get to be blessed. And here's the problem. It defames God's reputation because in honesty, it all becomes about us. And people see God as someone who spoils people. And then those who wait for it, it sees like God is stingy. So when we fall on either one of those extremes, that misunderstanding faith not only causes us to act dysfunctionally, it damages God's reputation. And it leaves you and I asking a really important question. Because listen, faith is something that regardless of what you believe about God and Jesus, is something that all of us practice, right? So what is faith, when it comes to Jesus, supposed to really look like? And here's the great news this morning. God doesn't leave you and I guessing. God knew that every generation would have to wrestle with the extremes of faith. Matter of fact, the Bible actually gives us a definition of faith. Now, I want to remind you, we're going to look at this verse in Hebrews that kind of defines um, what faith is. And this book of Hebrews was a letter written to Jewish Christians, both in Rome and Jerusalem, who were suffering persecution. And we're going to kind of look at what the definition that the Bible tells us about faith. And it says this, now faith is is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Remember last week we talked about this list? There's a list that begins right after this. And the list starts off with a group of people who like are great warriors and great people of faith and people who received the dead back to life and, and who did amazing things. And that's often the list that gets mentioned when we talk about faith. But remember last week we talked about the second half of that list? It, it included people who were persecuted who are mistreated, who are destitute and poor. And so it's not necessarily the what around us, but the who that determines faith. And so what I want to do is take a look at this definition of faith to make sure that we're having the right kind of faith in Jesus that we're supposed to have. So I'm going to break this verse down just a little bit old school style. We're going to put it up on the screen. It says, listen, now faith is confidence. What does confidence mean? That we can trust it. That word trust or conviction, something that you know is unmovable and unshakable. Now faith Faith is this trust, this unshakable conviction in what we hope for. Now, confidence and hope for, that's going to be really important as we kind of talk about what faith is. Because if you hope for something, that doesn't mean you have it now. Hold on to that thought. And then it doesn't just say there, this reiterates what faith is. The author's trying to remind us, listen, this is what faith is. And just in case you get confused, I'm going to say it again. It's kind of like mama, when mama tells us twice. And assurance about what we do not see. There's assurance. It's kind of like, listen, you can know for a fact, even though you can't see the whole of it. Now listen, some people take to not see as blind faith. And that's not what the author is talking about at all. And we're going to get into that. Now you might be saying, Matt, I grew up in a church. I've heard that, you know, kind of faith is blind, that you don't see it. And that like, you should just, you know, you get it now and it's about getting it. But, but this isn't what this is talking about. And, and here's why I know, because a little bit later in the book of Romans, the apostle Paul, who used to persecute the church, but then became a follower of Jesus because he 
he encountered a risen Christ, right? He writes a group of people in Rome who are followers of Jesus. Some of them have no church background. Some of them have Jewish church background. And some of them came from pagan backgrounds. And he writes them this. We see it in Romans 8. And it says this, For in this hope we are saved. Did you catch that? Like this hope actually does something for us. He says, for in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it. What's that word? Patiently. It's kind of like hoping for a Christmas present at Christmas. If you already have it, you're not hoping for it. If you grew up in that trust fund faith where you said you get it all now, the Bible tells us that it's not about getting it all now. The truth is we get the kingdom in part, not in full. This confidence, this trust that we can have the promises that God is true and good and that his promises are real and that he will fulfill the promises that he gave us. So you see that faith, faith in Jesus is kind of this mix of understanding that we have a secure inheritance that we hope for, that we don't get just yet, but we have a security to posit now. And so this morning, I want to share three truths when it comes to faith that are so important that will help you and I not swing to the extreme of trust fund faith or the earn it faith and we get it later. And so this morning, I'm going to hang on three of them, but the first one we're going to spend a little bit of time on because it is so important and it's so misunderstood. And here's the first truth about faith that the Bible tells us. Faith isn't meant to to be blind. Listen, I want to say something loud and clear to anyone who is kind of checking out South Point Church. Maybe you haven't said yes to Jesus yet. Maybe someone told you that you were supposed to have blind faith. I want you to know today, nowhere has God or Jesus ever asked anyone for blind faith. Matter of fact, you know, I know, we all know that blind faith often leads to damage in our lives. No one should go by blind faith. It just ruins the thing. Matter of fact, the authors who wrote that word, that we could be confident of what we hope for, that we could be assured of what we can't see. They weren't saying that you can't see anything, and they weren't saying that you never get what you hope for. See, the people who wrote that, at least in the Old Testament, knew that God never asked people to follow him without giving evidence that he was real and that he would show up. Matter of fact, it's the same thing Jesus did. Jesus never called for a blind faith. And you might be saying, Matt, are you sure about that? I see it actually in the scriptures. Matter of fact, I want to share a couple of verses. First, we're going to look at Psalm 19. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Listen, can maybe we admit something together? Listen, I don't know where you're at with Jesus or God or faith, but could we be honest for a minute? Could we look at the complexity and the beauty of the cosmos and go, it would require more faith to believe that that was an accident, that there was a creator. Could we look at the complexity and the beauty of all the life on planet Earth. Millions and millions of different life on the earth and go, man, like we could see a creator in that. Could we look at the complexity and the beauty of the human consciousness and human morality and realize that, man, we can see something greater. Matter of fact, God never calls people to blind faith. Matter of fact, it says this in the scripture in Romans, and it says this, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky through everything God has made. They can, what's that word? Clearly see. Maybe you want to type in see. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Listen, the reality is, is we can't see all of who God is. Now, Jesus gives us the clearest picture of who God is. If you want to see what God's like, look at Jesus. But the reality is, if God is truly God and we're finite beings, we could never see him in his wholeness. So when that scripture says we can't see, it doesn't mean we can't see anything. It just means we can't see all in the whole of who God is. Matter of fact, Jesus's own word says that our faith shouldn't be blind. Here's what Jesus says. But if I do his work, believe in the, what's the word Jesus used? Believe in the evidence of the miracle works that I've done. Even if you don't believe in me, Jesus is speaking to the Jewish leaders who don't believe in him. He says, listen, you might not believe me. You might not trust me. I know that maybe you have a trust factor issue. And he says, but I want you to look at the evidence of the things I do. Then you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I am 
am in the Father. So I want to clearly state today that nowhere in the Bible and nowhere does God or Jesus call you and I to blind faith. What God does call us to do is to have faith in what we can see of God in Jesus. And so I want to give you an example of what this looks like in everyday life. I've mentioned that I've been married for 26 years, right? And so listen, I knew my wife in high school. um, And so I've known her for a while. um, And I remember the day that I asked her to marry me. I I remember it vividly, right? Um, And here's the most amazing thing. Having been married to my wife for 26 years, I realized that when I asked my wife to marry her, I thought I knew her, but I didn't know all of who she would be and who she would grow into and how she would handle all the different things that have happened in our lives as we've been married, as we've moved, um, as we've planted a church, as as we've had kids, like all the things that we've gone through in life, I didn't know how she would respond and what what she would be like. But here's what I did know. When I asked her to marry me, there was a part of her life that I could see. I saw how she interacted with her sisters. I saw how she dealt with her college friends. I saw how her mom was like and what her dad was like and how she engaged the family. I saw how that she treated treated me. And while I didn't know everything about my wife when I asked her to marry me, I did know enough that I could trust her to ask her to be my wife, even though I didn't see or know all of her. And so I want to ask you today, if you're here and you haven't said yes to Jesus, and what you're really saying is the whole thing that's holding you back is, well, I don't know, because I can't see all of God, I can't say yes to any of God. And I go, does that really make sense? Can we see enough of God in creation? Can we see enough of God in Jesus? Anyone that would die for you is for you. We might not be able to see all of who God is, but we can say see enough to say yes, to know that we can trust his character. By the way, faith was never meant to be blind. If anyone asks you to follow them or God on blind faith, do not listen because it's not something that God or the Bible calls us to, which leads us into truth number two. And it's this, faith isn't about our feelings. Listen, listen, fear is a feeling Joy is a feeling, Um, you know, peace is a feeling, excitement is a feeling, Uh, nervousness is a feeling, faith is meant to be a choice. Is it possible that fear is a feeling that can lead to the choice of faith? You're going to hear me say that a lot. Fear is a feeling. Now, fear can become a mindset. We're going to talk a little bit about that next week, so you're not going to want to miss next week. But is it possible that faith isn't a feeling, that faith is a choice that we're supposed to make? I heard a statement by uh, an author and speaker. Her name is Lisa Turkhurst. And she made this statement, and it is, I'll never forget it as long as I live. It was so powerful and so good and so true. She said this. She said, feelings are indicators not dictators. I mean, how true is that? I was talking to one of my staff people, uh, Jen and Pastor Jen, and she said this. She said, feelings are allowed in the car. They're just not allowed to drive. Listen, all of us are going to have feelings in life. And here's what I discovered about feelings. If we're honest, feelings can often block the view of reality. Good feelings and bad feelings. Have you ever accomplished something really amazing and felt really good and really proud? And you said, look at all that I did, but it blocks the view of all the people that helped us. Maybe you feel good in pleasure, but that pleasure may come with a consequence that we don't want to pay for later. Maybe in the feeling of pain, in the feeling of disappointment, maybe we feel unloved or uncared for or that God isn't for us. Here's what I've discovered about feelings. Feelings can often block our view, but just because our view is blocked doesn't mean that something has disappeared. Maybe you just want to type in blocked view if you've ever had your view of God or truth blocked by feelings. I want to share a true story. Um, This is about my daughter. Um, She was probably three or four um, at at the time. She was running around her house. She tripped and fell, and her head fell right into the corner of a chair. I mean, it popped a dime-sized hole in her head. I mean, you could stick my finger almost like to her skull, right? We saw it. It was bleeding. We rushed her to the emergency room. We happened to know the doctor who was on call that day who was going to do the stitches. Um, And they put her in this thing called a papoose because she was so young. They didn't want her to freak out and, like, squirm and hit the doctor. 
doctor as, as he was putting stitches in. And he said, hey, listen, I'm going to have to do something to your daughter, so I need you to hold her hand. He says, um, to make sure that like the area is sanitized and that she doesn't scratch or do anything, we have to kind of cover her eyes and keep that area sterile. And I'll never forget what happened. As soon as they covered her eyes, she started thrashing around. They had to call in two nurses to hold her down. And she was screaming. Like, I started crying. I'll never forget this. She started crying, Daddy, Daddy, help. And I was literally holding her hand and in her ear going, Daddy's right here. It's okay. Daddy's right here. But because she couldn't see me, she thought I wasn't there. In the middle of her getting the very help she needed, she could only go by her feelings and not realizing that I was holding her hand, speaking into her ear, Daddy's right here. I love you. And I wonder whether it's a good feeling or bad feeling. Maybe if feelings block our view of the character and the goodness of God. What if faith is never meant to be about our feelings? What if faith is never about the what or how we feel, but about the who that we put our trust in? Which leads me to truth number three, and I'm going to put it up on the screen. It says, faith frees us from the slavery of circumstances. I mean, see, here's the most amazing new news that when you and I say yes to Jesus, because of Jesus, God through his spirit, he comes and lives in us and empowers you and I to do what is good and to make the right choices, no matter what circumstances and no matter how we feel. I often ask people who are wrestling with believing in God or having faith in Jesus, and I would ask you this question. Do you really want to believe that there is no God? Because if there is no God or creator, then the only God you're left with is circumstances. And then you have to think, if circumstances are your God, that is a cruel God because you can't control all the circumstances that happen to you. You don't get to determine what family you're born into. You might not always get to choose the boss that you have. None of us expected or would choose this pandemic that we're in the middle of, if our lives are determined by our circumstances, then we are slaves. And the truth is, Jesus said, I've come to set you free. You see, faith frees us from the slavery of circumstances. You see, our trust and our hope, not in the what, but in the who that conquered hell and death, means that you and I are no longer slaves to our circumstances. That you and I have the ability through God's presence that lives on the inside of us to choose how we respond no matter what the situation is. Um, I did a Facebook Live this past Wednesday, and one of the questions that I asked is, hey, is there a show or a movie series or something that you've been binging on Netflix? And if you've binged this week, maybe you just want to type a binge into the chat. Uh, but my wife and I, we rewatched the series, The Hunger Games. You know, Hunger Games, Catching Fire, Mockingjay 1 and Mockingjay 2. I forgot how good it was. But there was a striking scene in the very first movie of Hunger Games. It involved the lead character. His name was PETA. And it was before for the games and he was up at night and couldn't sleep and, and the, the kind of the co-character Katniss comes out and says, why are you up? And he makes this profound statement. He says, I don't want the, to let them change me into something I'm not. I mean, did you catch that? He says, listen, I'm being forced into this circumstances. I'm in a place that I don't want to be, that I didn't choose. I wouldn't be here if I didn't have to. I wouldn't deal with these people the way I would have to. I'm in a circumstances that I didn't choose, but I don't want to let that circumstance change me from what I was meant to be. And that's exactly why Jesus conquered hell and death. And so that no matter what circumstances you and I get put in, we are free to be the sons and daughters that were are meant to be in Christ. Faith frees us from the slavery of circumstances. Because if we only respond to the circumstances around us, then circumstances become our God. And that is a cruel God. Faith in the one who died for us sets us free so that we can become who we were meant to be. Now, if I had to wrap this all up this morning, I would say it's something like this. Faith is when we choose to act. There's a big difference between faith and belief, okay? You see, faith honors God. Belief usually creates hypocrisy. Belief is where we go, I believe something, but my actions don't match it. Faith means it is a conviction so true that I act on it. Faith is when we choose to act in the security of God's character and not in the uncertainty of our circumstances. You see, faith isn't about the what, you're gonna hear me say this over, but in the who we trust in. Is the who that we trust in ourselves? 
Is the who we trust in in the circumstances of the people around us? Or is the who that we trust in is the security of God's character? This, you'll hear me say this often. Anybody that would die for you is for you. If God would send his one and only son, not junk, his one and only son, who would leave heaven and come down to this busted and broken world and be abandoned, betrayed, and tortured, and be separated for the only time in eternity with his heavenly father to bear my sin, your sin, our sin, and conquer hell and death for us. Doesn't that speak to his character that anyone that is for you is for you? And so you and I are left with a choice. It's a choice that we make every day. We practice faith every day, regardless of our religious backgrounds. And at some point, we will all put our faith in something. We'll either put faith in ourselves or in our circumstances, or we can put our faith in the one whose character we can trust. I was thinking about how do I close? And I want to be really honest about faith. I believe in faith. I believe that God's character is totally trustworthy. Matter of fact, I believe God's character was so trustworthy. I asked uh, this woman to marry me and we've been married 26 years. Matter of fact, I believe in the character of God so much that I moved my family. My wife was pregnant with her first child to St. Mary's to start Young Life with $3,000 in the bank. And I saw God show up and do amazing things. I left my Young Life career to start a thing called South Point Church. And I was only getting paid $500 a month from the church. And I would have to raise the rest of my support. I saw the faithfulness and the character of God in that. Matter of fact, when we looked for our first permanent campus, there were so many obstacles only to see God come through and trust his character. I can't tell you the number of times in my life that God has shown up and his character is true. And so yes, we can experience part of God and his goodness and here and now, we can experience the kingdom now. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life to the full. And I've had the opportunity to trust that and experience God's goodness. And I've also experienced the trouble that Jesus talked about. There was a season in ministry where I was sick for almost two years, where I was in and out of the hospital and my body didn't work. In the middle of that season, my wife and I had a miscarriage. We have an immediate family member who had a medical issue that kept us up at night. You see, if anyone tells you that faith gives you everything you want now, or you get a pass from life, or anyone tells you faith is about all that you get in the future and you just have to be miserable now, both extremes aren't the kind of faith that Jesus taught about. Is it possible that the kind of faith that Jesus invites us into is never about the what around us? but instead the who that we put our hope and our trust in. And so I simply want to close with a simple question for all of us. As we go through this unprecedented season, as we go through this day and through this week, I want to ask you a question. What is determining your response? Are you acting on the character of God or are your choices based on the uncertainty of our circumstances? Because both of those choices lead to very different outcomes. And I want you to know today, if you say, well, I haven't made a choice, no choice is a choice. And my encouragement to all of us is to go that there's a God who is trustworthy and good. His character is good, and we can put our hope and our trust in him. I want to close with a quote from Pastor Greg Rochelle. He talks about having a plan for a life and that God has purpose. I don't know if you've never been told this, but I want you to hear today that God's got a plan and a purpose for your life. But here's the truth. The purpose and plan that God has for us is rarely easy. And if I was honest with you today, following Jesus is the toughest thing I've ever done. It is rarely easy, but it is absolutely good. So what? Will you put your hope and your trust in this week? Our hope and our prayer is that it would be in the one who conquered hell and death for you and I. And his name is Jesus. Let me pray for us. Hey God, I'm grateful that you never call us to blind faith, 
but that we can look at the complexity and beauty of creation and the cosmos and our, and our kind of our, our conscience and know that there's a God and a creator. God, we can look to the empty tomb that for the first three and a half centuries, there was no Bible. It was the resurrection of Jesus that caused followers to follow you during the most persecuted time. Heavenly Father, you never call us to blind faith, but to trust in your character that you will be true to your promise, that you've given us the gift of your presence. You've given us the gift and the security of the empty tomb and that our inheritance after this is secure, that there will be a time where you will fulfill your promise to make all wrong things right, to not put our trust in circumstances, but to put our trust in the God who loved us and died for us. Thank you. Thank you that you are trustworthy. God, would you keep us? I pray that you would come and be present in our lives. Give us eyes to see you, ears to hear you, and hearts that are open. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. God bless.